This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by JetBrains, maker of intelligent development tools to simplify your challenging tasks and automate the routine ones. JetBrains is offering a 25% discount for an individual license on the C++ tool of your choice, C Lion, ReSharp, or C++, or AppCode. Use the coupon code JetBrains for CPP Cast during checkout at JetBrains.com. Episode 123 of CPP Cast with guest Isabella Muerte, recorded October 13th, 2017. In this episode, we talk about the coming software apocalypse. Then we talk to Isabella Muerte. Izzy talks to us about build systems and her concerns with the modules TS. Welcome to episode 124 of CPP Cast, the only podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Rob. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. It's been a long <laughs> week, but I'm good. So it's Friday. Do you have a beer with you? No, but I kind of want one. I, I might need to get one after the show. Okay. How about you? Uh, well, yeah, I have one planned for after the show myself, actually. <laughs> it's great. Well, at the top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, we got a tweet from Paul writing in, uh, Thanks for getting Titus on the show. Looking forward to seeing how Absail can be used in our code base. Uh, beware Twitter autocorrect. Uh, yeah, Absail is not a commonly written word. I guess he, he ran into some problems with that. That's funny. I wonder what it did. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it was great talking to Titus, and uh, the AppSale library does look pretty interesting. So I'm, I'm curious to see uh, how many people go about implementing it and, and pulling it into their code bases and, and what kind of experience they have with it. Yeah, if it becomes something like, you know, Boost or something where you it's like kind of expected that people might be using it. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Joining us today is Isabella Muerte. Izzy is a C++ Bruja and build system trash goblin. She taught herself to program by writing a build system and immediately regretting the decision. Her first computer ran Windows Millennium Edition, and her parents forbade her from upgrading to anything else for five years. She is still bitter about this. In her spare time, she is open into open source software, tattoos, computer keyboards, and making fake cover bands like Rage Against the Abstract Machine. <laughs> Izzy, welcome to the show. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, you might be either the first guest we've had or the first guest we've had to admit that your first computer ran Windows MB. I, it's, <laughs> not, it's something that I don't hide. You know, it, it, it ran into interesting things. Uh, I know Windows really well as a result. So, still run it. I imagine. You still run it, you said? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Whether you have a VM or do you have like a separate box set up with ME or what? Uh, no, 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 not Windows ME, just Windows. As oh, okay. No, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, but that's some nostalgia. Yeah, no, but when uh, when Vista came out and everyone was like, "Ah, oh, it's the new ME," I'm like, nah, "It was not." <laughs> I used ME. No, no. <laughs> I actually bought ME uh, intentionally, upgraded a few computers to it. Yeah, I don't really know why def, the time. Def, definitely got use out of that, uh, uh, what was the feature? System Restore? It was Windows 98 with System mm. Restore. <laughs> That's all it was. A, bu- a buggy Windows 98 oh, with System yeah. Restore. <laughs> yeah, 98 was so much better, and 2000, so much better. The other options at the time, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, brief moment of silence for uh, AOL Instant Messenger, which was announced as being shut down in December. Yeah, I saw that. S- oh, yeah. Really, really surprising that it had gone on for that long. Uh, yeah, actually, I had logged into it like three months ago, and I was like, I have 500 people on my friends list. I do not know half of who these people <laughs> are anymore, but none of them have been online in at least six years. And, and wow. I was just going through and just deleting old accounts, and I locked that account away behind some random... Uh, uh, like email address that I just like put in and then generated a password, deleted it, 
set set sail to it because I was like, I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> I've, got, I've got Discord now. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> there's definitely some logic there for, for kind of quietly putting away your AOL account just in case someone were to try to hack it or something later. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. I mean, like my, my Yahoo account from 2001 was hacked at some point, which it's Yahoo. <laughs> like, I'm not expecting anything, but uh, I can't reactivate it for use because it's such an old account. It takes you to a uh, 2002 web page that no longer exists on the site. And then when you try to contact wow. the email address that they give you because it can't find it, it's also a really old email address that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so I was just like... Eh, whatever, I'll just change the password. Who cares? <laughs> you can't you can't use this for anything anyways, but I wanted to delete my personal info because I had my uh dead name and, and uh date of birth up uh in the info. So Right. Yeah. <laughs> anyways. Okay, well Izzy, we got a, a couple news articles <laughs> yeah, to discuss. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh no, it's fine. Feel free to comment on any of these and uh and then we'll start talking to you about uh modules and build systems. Okay. For sure. Okay, so this first one uh, is currently the top post on the CPP subreddit. Uh, I just found a use for the poop emoji in C++. And uh, I'm just impressed that this code works and uh, that people on the subreddit community are, are enjoying it so much. <laughs> <laughs> so do either of you actually have to work with Unicode on a regular basis? Uh I don't think I do. No. Uh, d- depends. Unicode in the source code, rarely. Unicode itself, yes. Okay, yeah. I, I don't really have to in C++. I haven't in a while. It's not fun. <laughs> yeah. There's what, no- what the code actually does is if you're running Visual Studio and you're using Unicode, you need to have a, a UTF-8 flag. And if you are trying to use Unicode without the UTF-8 flag, this code that makes use of the poop emoji would, uh, would throw a static assert. Okay. Yeah. The... Uh, uh, my my discovery that um, C++ did in fact support emoji uh, it was sometime in the past like two years and I was like oh so when Swift came out and they're like and you can use emojis as variables and then I was like oh it'd be <laughs> kind of neat if we could use that in C++ but it would also be a nightmare and then I found out oh actually since 1998 you've been able to use any part of the Unicode spectrum minus like certain sub characters like the dollar sign and whatnot so you can use uh you can't use the dollar sign. It's like not in the like supported uh, set of characters, but you can use the full width hmm. dollar sign because that's in the Unicode uh, like plane. So, okay. Yeah, fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> the the other interesting thing about this post on on about the poop emoji is apparently it's not only the current highest post on the uh, CPP subreddit, it's actually the highest voted post of all time. 616 which points, is, apparently. It's- yeah. <laughs> it's Which is a little sad that this is what, you know, gets more votes than anything else. And I looked at what the other top posts of all time were, uh, and uh, there's also Hitler on C++17, <laughs> uh, and this post where someone thought Visual Studio was adding uh, some type of tracking telemetry into their compiled code. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those, those are always the fun posts. Like, Microsoft is, <laughs> is tracking me, and then they start to spell Microsoft with right. a dollar sign, like it's 2003 again. Takes, <laughs> right. takes me back. Yeah. Uh, also, I'm not surprised that the memes get up at the top of the, of the subreddit. No. You, can't, you can't argue about memes. You can't say no. you can't say a meme is dumb. You'll just get downvoted. That's how it works. You know, I'm pre- I'm pretty sure we actually covered the uh, Hitler on C plus plus seventeen as a news item. Did. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. <laughs> and I remember we covered it because Bjarna made a post uh, defending C plus plus from Hitler in the comments. <laughs> Fun times, right? Okay, so what? moving on. Uh, this next one, uh, C++ core guidelines, class hierarchies, and this is on the uh, modern C++ blog from uh, Rainier Grimm. And he's, uh seems to be going through all of the core guidelines and, and making a post kind of explaining the different guidelines, giving some sample code about them. So it definitely seems like a, a valuable resource that he's putting out here. That sounds like quite the effort to try to go through all of them. Yeah, and and this is the first of the posts that I've seen, but he's on, he's going through items one twenty to one twenty two in this post, and right. he's going through each one in a decent amount of detail. 
Uh, it looks like at the bottom of the post, he's actually at 126 through 128 as well. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so I actually don't agree with one of these core guidelines. Which one? Uh, uh, maybe I misunderstood it. I thought one of them was saying that all... It, well, okay, this one that says, if a base class is used as an interface, make it a pure abstract class. And I like okay. mostly agree with this. They're basically saying don't put any data in your base class interface. But mm-hmm. if your derived class is a templated class, then you end up potentially duplicating lots of code being stamped out by the compiler in your template instantiations. And if there's something that you can move that's shared into the base class, I'm all for that. I, uh, I'm of the opinion that there is no such thing as a pure abstract class in C++. Um, and that's simply because even if you do the virtual void function equals zero, you can still actually make an implementation of that function that if it gets called, will actually end up calling mm-hmm. that. And so there's really no point in having a pure virtual function because it's not actually pure because you can make an implementation for it as a fallback. And I mean, all, all it does is prevent you from making an instance of that class. Right, 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 right. But some people will be like, oh, but it also means you have to implement it every time, and that's not true. And so, right. Yeah. And the next article we have is from Fluent C++ uh, Partitioning with the STL. And uh, we talk about Jonathan Bakker's blog. They're always really well written. And in this one, he's going through uh, the STL partition algorithms. I liked that he put his uh, dailyable content stamp at the top of this one that we talked about when he was on the show. Oh, yeah. I didn't notice that. Yeah. it's a good point. So this is something that you could go over in a really quick presentation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also, since I know Jonathan's going to listen to this episode, <laughs> will point out that he should have mentioned that stable partition is able to allocate and the other algorithms don't allocate. Hmm. So... <laughs> be interesting to see if he responds to that i guess <laughs> yeah okay and then this last article we have this is a really long one but uh i do think it's it's worth reading uh, and this is on the atlantic and it's called the coming software apocalypse and it's kind of hard to summarize because this article kind of <laughs> goes in a bunch of different directions did you both have a chance to read the whole thing uh, so i actually did not have a chance to read this but i kind of already know like just reading the first paragraph i already kind of know what it's about and it's stuff that i have i i'm a very snarky person with very strong opinions about a lot of things uh as you can tell from yeah. my posts regarding modules and whatnot <laughs> but uh there yeah i i know i get the general gist of it and i agree with probably the yeah. entire premise of it just going through it real quick and i'm seeing some quotes that yeah yeah, I mean, they, they kind of go start off by talking about some horrible, horrible things that have happened because of bad code, like, you know, 9-11 systems going down because someone picked this arbitrary number as the max number of 911 calls to ever get handled, and then the system just kind of silently stopped answering 911 calls. Um, and then move on to talking about how, you know, in the uh, airline industry, they apparently don't really write code the traditional way they use model based design where you kind of thoroughly model out the system and then generate code from that and how they, they don't really have, you know, bugs in the software anymore because of that. And maybe that's going to be the future of a whole lot more software. And I think my favorite example from that was the, uh, radiation treatment machine that was killing patients because of a bug in the software. Oh, through X 25. Yeah. Yeah. That's a classic one. I have not was not aware of that previously. Uh, there's there's also another one that's a little less known. I always get the details of this wrong, but it's uh, I think it got I want to say a couple. This was during the second uh, Iraq War, um, and it was some Patriot missile software uh, failed because it was written for 64 bit software, and then basically rewritten and just compiled to work. And I'm doing air quotes right now for listeners. <laughs> Um, so that it would run on a 16-bit CPU that the that the Patriot missiles would work off of. And um, when Saddam Hussein was firing some Scud missiles at a military base, um, the defense Patriot missile thing uh, basically failed twice, and the missiles were unable to intercept the Scud missiles, and uh, several several mm-hmm. U.S. service members uh, perished as a result. 
Um, Goodness gracious. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. with uh, self-driving cars and failing infrastructure in the United States, I can see a lot more uh, software bugs causing um, harm to people in the future. If something is yeah, happening. I uh, I occasionally have conversations with people who aren't programmers, and I say, I, I, I make maybe a bit of a general, generalization and say, I don't really know any programmers who would currently trust self-driving cars. <laughs> uh, I know I wouldn't yet. Is, do we do we agree, or is there any dissenting views here? I, I absolutely do not trust them. I also don't trust uh, any of our infrastructure involving like water or gas or electricity or anything like that because I've uh, I've heard things about like oh, there's like unprotected Wi-Fi systems in the middle of Montana mm-hmm. that are running for aqueducts and there's no security or like not broadcasting an SSID for Wi-Fi automatically makes it secure is like the, you know, idea that some, some software engineers have of like, this is good enough security for, for this. And it's like, you know, people are worried about, uh, on, on, in some political circles, they're worried about people coming up from the Mexico border. And it's like, you should be, really more worried about people coming in from Canada and messing with the infrastructure, but I don't want, I don't want to get put on another watch list. So I'm already, I'm already on the uh, Comcast watch list. So, <laughs> wow. Well, it, it is worth, uh, worth reading in, uh, to make you, uh, afraid of nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> <Great>. So <laughs> we're, yes. <laughs> yeah. So Izzy, um, you were at CVPCon 2017, and it seems like you got a bit of attention yeah. for raising concerns about the modules TS. Yeah, uh, mission accomplished. Where should we start with your concerns? Um, I so let's start with uh, no one on the committee can agree as to what a module is, um, and I think that that's my biggest concern. Uh, so, like, if I were to ask either of you, like, what is a module? Um, I don't think that your answer would be anywhere close to what it is in the modules TS. And I'm not even going to try to answer. I'll just say that right yeah, now. Yeah, like it's 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 confusing. Um, it's kind of I feel like uh, it does a lot of things that GoLang did, the Google GoLang, where it was like, yeah, yeah, we're going to develop this with our heads down and ignore the past 40 years of you know modules in other languages to develop this thing for this one particular problem um, that works for this one particular vendor, and then everyone else will just have to deal with it is is kind mm. of like the least polite way I have of, of phrasing it without <laughs> cursing. Um, and uh, uh, like if, if we can at least get the committee to agree on what a module is, I would be okay with that. But as of right now, um, for those that don't know about the models TS, um, we have uh, uh, a interface module translation unit and we have an implementation module translation unit. And if you're like, wait, isn't that kind of like what a header and a CPP file are for? Congratulations, you, you've made the connection. Uh, and this also leads into the issue that I have, which is, um, you know, I can't, and this is going to be a really bad pun, but I'm a millennial, so I really don't care. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, how can I dag on the haters, dependent acyclical graph on the haters? Um, under every compiler right now, yes, there used to be tools like make depends, but in the past you know, however many years, um, certainly after I started writing software, um, in the mid, mid aughts, uh, and whatnot. But, um, uh, the, 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 the gist of it is, is, um, under current system, I can name a CPP file and then the compiler will, um, you know, search for the headers and then I can get that dependency information in like the form of a make file or a list of includes like through NSVC, some way to tell me, these are the headers that we also need to depend on. And I can create a graph from that information. Um, and with modules, the problem is, is that um, right now, there is no way for me to run a compiler once, right? So when I get the dependency information currently under headers, I compile the file and also I'm able to get the header information in that run at the same time. And um, and that's all done in like one pass, if you will. and. You know, there's going to be someone out there that's like, ah, but the C++ compiler has nine translation phases, so joke's on you. But what I'm saying is, is I only have to run the executable <laughs> once, is what, is what my point is. Um, under modules, right. if I have a statement that says import A, um, forgetting the fact that there is no guaranteed way to search for A and where it could be located, um, A has to already have an existing uh, compiled binary interface or... Um, uh, Boris Kalvikov calls it a, Boris, uh, a binary 
module interface. There's no like actual word for it. Um, Gabby Dos Reyes just calls it an IFC file for, I think, interface container, something similar to that um, interface file container. And um, that that has to exist before you can compile the file. So I basically have to say, okay, here's you know my file. It imports module B. B has to already have an IFC existing. Um, and if it doesn't, then I can't compile the module that's importing it. So I basically have to go up this massive chain, find all these files. Um, and there's also additional issues of, for instance, um, uh, you know, the name of the module is not tied to its file. It's not tied to the directory it's in. It's not tied to anything. It's just a unique name that's supposed to represent it, which I'm fine with. Um, you know, having having your files tied to that under the current C++ abstract machine, I think is is a mistake. But then again, one could also argue that it's 2017. Files have existed for a long time. We can say that the C++ standard doesn't know what a file is because we now have the file system sublibrary as part of the standard. And mm-hmm. that has a concept of what a file is and what a directory is. Um, and at the very least, if we could abstract away the concept of, you know, uh, a translation unit can be contained in some kind of a container and then you can have sub collections of those containers inside of collections of containers, basically directories. Um, I think that that would alleviate this issue, but what's going to probably happen is that there's going to be build systems that turn, um, the unique names that you have inside of a module into one format of looking them up. Another build system will do a completely different mapping. Um, some will permit you to map from a to B, a to C, a to D, whatever mapping you want for these naming conventions. Um, but it's, I think it's going to fragment things a lot worse. And I think the committee needs to say something about it. Um, and you can't be as vague about it. Um, and some people have said, well, why don't we just turn the compiler into a build system? Um, D does that. Rust does that in a way. Um, and I'm actually not entirely against that. But if we're trying to keep C++ the standard separate from C++ the tools, then yes, I would agree in, in that sense. But... Um, I don't know if this is making any sense, but it's it's. Uh, there are serious issues. I've made two posts about it. One where I gave a small little rant, and then one where I made uh-huh. a massive large rant. Um, so if anyone was trying to get me to write more than one blog post a year, uh, congratulations, you you won. Um, <laughs> I've written more blog posts in the, uh, in the past week than I have in the past two years, um, and uh, it's it's just. Um, the the defense that I get from people that have been that are working on the modules TS that are in favor of the modules TS is well we'll make our build systems you know module aware and they don't explain on that um, you know what does that mean like are you going to give it a potion that makes it so it can see modules suddenly like is this like here's a mirror so you can find which modules are real and which ones are vampires like there's no like deterministic way of like here's how you find a module. And there's also been no proof of it at like a massive scale. Um, I know some people have said that like, you know, we're using it in this way at Google, but the Google implementation of modules is actually completely different from the modules TS. And from what right. I understand, Richard Smith mm-hmm. and uh, company will be um, uh, putting a new uh, paper forward uh, in January or February, but the vote f- to turn the modules technical specification into an actual technical specification is coming up in November. Uh, specifically November 6th. And I think if I wanted to get a paper in to say, no, please don't do this unless you fix these things, um, I have three days to write that as of this recording. I think that's right. It's Friday the 13th at the moment. Um, Although I I don't know when this episode's going to go up. But um, so, but by the time the episode goes up, I assume that the mailing deadline will have ended. That deadline will be definitely, yeah. yeah. So, um, excuse me. Oh gosh, that's the coat coming up. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so when you were at CVPCon, did you have a chance to talk to many committee members? I did. About some of your concerns. I did. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a this one hotel, the Seattle Marriott Bellevue, which most people will sit in the lobby of um, after the uh, talks of the day, and they'll kind of like hash things out and have conversations about various things. Sometimes you get off topic and start talking about music or you end up talking about, in my case, build systems and the modules TS. And, um, I had, uh, I had actually mentioned this in my, uh, trip report. Um, but I had been talking to one person 
about like my problems with the module's technical specification and why I thought it was not a good idea and why our build systems need to be better and just laying all this stuff out uh, over the course of several days. And then um, someone had like spoken to me at some other point and they were like, have you spoken to Richard Smith? You know, he's, he's like one of the people that edits the standard. He's really important in the community. Um, you should really tell him these things that you've been saying. And I was like, yeah, uh, like hopefully if I, if I get to meet the guy, like I've never met him really. And, um, and then as I was sitting there the day after the day, the conference ended, um, sitting in the lobby, talking to some people, this guy I'd been speaking to came up and then someone said, Oh, speak, speak of the devil. This is Richard Smith. And so this huh. guy that I had been thinking of, of like, Oh man, this guy gets it. It's a shame. I can't speak to Richard Smith was in fact, Richard Smith the entire time. So, <laughs> so, uh, definitely, definitely worth it. But, um, I had a chance to speak to him, uh, Chandler Carew, a couple other people, but, um, did not get to speak to Gabby Dos Reyes. Uh, mostly because after I gave my talk, uh, since this was the first like talk longer than six minutes I'd ever given at any conference, um, I was exhausted and basically slept for the next two days. Uh, so I was not able to find him by the time the conference had ended. Um, and I, and I had not been able to see, um, I wanted to fully wait to give like my, like, this is going to be bad or a nightmare, um, uh, like decision until I'd seen Boris Kalbakov's, uh, talk. Um, the, he's the creator of Built 2, um, which okay. is, as of right now, I think the only build system that actually supports uh, every implementation of the Modules TS out there for GCC, Clang, and MSVC. Um, and uh, and he does it by having a separate tool run, which I'm absolutely against, because I don't think that we should have this black box, unspecified, un, uh, you know, like non-existent tool as of right now have to run on our source code, especially if you know, like it works for 30 files. Like you have to open up every file, find where the module names are and whatnot, since they're not tied to the, to the file name. And like someone can make the argument of, well, you could just make a mapping for it just because we say that this is like what people should do. Doesn't mean they actually do. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think no proof of that is better than looking at the Qt community. People say you should keep your headers and your CPP files separate. And if you look at most Qt projects, they're all in one massive directory. Um, and like that could cause huge problems. Uh, if you have, you know, .axx and .cxx files next to each other for modules, um, that could definitely go uh, up up a creek real quick um, without a paddle. And uh, I think that's the correct phrase. But regardless, <laughs> <laughs> uh, regardless, though, it's it's I'm I'm against us having to have a tool not specified by the standard. Um, that has to find our dependencies for us. And um, technically the compiler can do that with headers. And while people say, well, it's not technically specified in the standard, um, it is specified that you get a unique ID that you give to the preprocessor and the preprocessor finds that file for you in some implementation okay. defined way for the platform that you're on. Um, it doesn't matter that we use file paths. Um, it could be like a resource fork on a Mac OS classic for all I care. But the compiler, the preprocessor, is part of the compiler. It's part of that translation phase, and it finds that file for us, or it finds that header file. Um, we also refer the to the fact that there are, in fact, headers. Even if the standard says, well, there's no way to actually find a header safely, it does have to find some headers, like cstid.io, uh, you know, ISO 646, uh, you know, the vector header. These things do exist. And I think, um, you know, some people want to stay future future compliant and say, oh, well, you know, like what if in 30 years we're not going to have, um, uh, what do you call it? We're, we're not going to have these concepts of files. They'll just be like data floating in various like databases. Like it doesn't matter <laughs> because even, even then like a directory is a file system is just a database that you can't treat like an SQL DB. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, I think, I think the ship has already sailed on that. Um, we've got, I don't, I don't know, like when was the first concept of a file on a, you know, system created? We've got that many decades of it. Um, we haven't seen any changes in how files are handled aside from like mobile. And even then people, um, you know, they still save images to Dropbox and then Dropbox shows up as a file. So they know, oh, an image is a file. Um, I don't think that the concept of a file is going to go away anytime soon. I think we should just embrace that, um, with the standard and, um, just kind of accept that this is a thing that we need to deal with and, and probably specify in the standard, especially since, as I said earlier, we have the file system header. So why would we have a file system header if for, for the C++ abstract machine, if the C++ abstract machine does not understand the concept of a file, 
it just it seems like a very strange um, contradiction to me, and I I think that something should be decided. That's probably a very unpopular uh, opinion with a lot of community members, and frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Um, but again, I have very strong opinions about a lot of things, and I'm 28 and a millennial, so obviously I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how many people did you get agreeing with you after your talk and in these conversations? Um, so people agreed with me about a variety of different things. People said that the mo- uh, the modules TS needs to, does need to have some changes done. Um, other people said build systems need to be fixed as well. Okay. Um, the build systems thing, I think I'm a little more focused on than the modules uh, because modules, like I'm one person that's not on the committee that can't afford to be on the committee. And um, I'm also not a compiler implementer. And I also don't have a solution for what modules could be. Aside from like, right. you know, tie it to the file system, which would also upset a million people too. So people don't want that because they're like, well, how do I upgrade my source code directories? Um, to which my response is carefully, um, <laughs> <laughs> carefully and maybe never because it's going to be a while before you get that feature anyways, before you upgrade your compiler to a modules capable compiler. Anyhow, probably um, I still know of some, game developers that are using C++ 2003 and it's, it's like, well, like what, what are you going to do? Um, and, uh, uh, as, as for the modules thing though, I did get some, I did have some brief tweets, uh, Twitter rants, um, uh, where I then received some direct messages from people saying like, I'm part of this national body. So I can't give my personal opinion as part of the national body, but I can state no comment or something similar to that. Um, so, uh, there are people that are definitely against the models TS on the committee. Um, I heard word that unless a few things are changed, uh, Bloomberg is a no, uh, but that could be a rumor. Hmm. Like, don't, do not quote me on that, please. Like I, I (laughs) just kind of late now you're on, you're on air. Oh, I'm on the record. Oh no. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but, but it's, it's. It's it's something that needs to be taken care of. I think at the, at the very least, we can't have something this important be this vague, um, because in a so so for instance uh, as a as an example, um, you know if in thirty files it's easy to open them up and scan those files for their unique names. And if you if you require a mapping and your build system requires a mapping, fine, whatever. But if you go to another project and it uses a different mapping and a different naming scheme. And it has, or if you are Google and you have like 250 million lines, of or code. if you have 300,000 files in a single directory, um, or multiple yeah. directories, you know, you have to have a unique name for every module that you have. And, um, yeah, you can have one interface file and then you can have as many implementation files, same way as you can have one header file and as many, you know, CPP files. Um, and this, this is an issue I think in, in that sense of, um, sorry, a little bit of a rant right there. Uh, you can, it's, it's hard because to find this one module, you have to basically scan this entire directory. And if you scan it the first time, fine, but then you have to constantly be rescanning it. If anyone makes a change to a file, and if you have a company like Google where they are making massive changes to these directories, especially for their low level libraries where they're adding files or modifying files constantly, that's going to cause a lot of churn. And a lot of people say, well, everyone has an SSD nowadays. And that's not true at all. Um, no. It is, it is not true. I, uh, uh, you know, I, I have an SSD, but I also work in tech. And this is also a thing that I see in general of people saying, oh, well, you know, if you work in tech, you have this. But it's, it's you know, there are kids probably out there that are on 5,400 RPM laptops that are hand-me-downs because they're in the Midwest or something like that. There's people that don't have, um, you know, anything above DSL speeds in the Midwest in the United States, there are people in Eastern Europe, I'm sure that have, um, less than ideal computer systems and, um, saying, well, you know, everyone that matters has, this is, um, I'm not saying it's classist, but it's, it's making a, it's making a statement that like, well, these people are not as important. What matters is the people that actually have jobs, not the people that are going to, you know, inherit the mind share for C++ because in 20 years, um, you know, I would argue that most of the people that are currently on the committee are not going to be on the committee anymore. Um, either they will right. have retired, hopefully. Uh, and even if they don't retire, like they, they may die. Like death is a thing that people don't talk a lot 
about in software. Den- Dennis Ritchie died three years ago, I think, um, as of a couple days ago. And um, like that's a big deal. Like Dennis Ritchie, one of the creators of C, does not exist on this plane of existence anymore. Um, also, I th- yeah, you know, he's he's the R and K and R, and he does not exist anymore as a human being. And this is going to happen to all of these people. And if if you're just like, well, we'll do, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. It's like we're starting to get ready to cross that bridge. By the time we cross that bridge, we need to be able to look back and see the people that are getting ready to cross the bridge. And if they're not there, then um, you know, there's no point in continuing with it. If that makes sense, that it's kind of like morbid the direction I'm going with this. <laughs> but um, you know, the 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 point I'm trying to make is that. You're when you have brain drain, you end up with stuff where people are like, no one knows this unless you get on the job training, and you know, COBOL is in that that uh, situation, and I would argue Fortran mm-hmm. is going to be in that situation in maybe a couple couple years, maybe a decade, um, yeah. where there, there will be people that still use it, but um, you know, so I've, not experts, not not experts, or uh, not people that are using modern Fortran, uh, like Fortran two thousand eight has like classes and public and private functions and protected inheritance and all these modern things. And I still hear, Oh yeah, I used Fortran, Fortran 77. And you know, like that's a completely different language than Fortran 2008. Um, even on Twitter, people were telling me, yeah, Fortran modules are a nightmare to work with. Um, and that's not something mm-hmm. that is, that is fun to deal with. And, um, like I haven't even looked at it because like I, what 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 purpose do I have to look at Fortran? I don't write in it. I don't use it. I don't get on the job training. Um, you know, Ada as a language is dying. There's like one compiler you can use, really, and that's it. Like these languages that are from the '70s are not being used anymore. They've got brain drain, and they're going to not die, but they're going to become less important. And if you want that for C plus plus, great, stay on the committee um, and do nothing. <sighs> And, and do nothing. Do, the, the important thing is do nothing and be on the committee. But if you want to avoid that, you need to start thinking about, you know, the kids and the the young people that are getting into C++, like um, like Sarah Chips Jewelbots, who she was on the show, I think, um, a couple months back, maybe. Yeah. Um, yep. And uh, that's, a, that's a great project. And um, I also got into a brief argument with Titus Winters, actually, at CppCon, and he was like, I've taught... 18 year olds and they come in and they don't know, you know, what they're doing. It's like, well, that's cause they're 18 year olds. Like, right. have, you, have you met an 18 year old? I have, I used to be one too. Like, but, but an eight year old child does not, does not think in the same way as an 18 year old. And I think in my opinion, a lot easier to teach than, um, you know, uh, adult kids in college. Uh, they haven't been, if you'll pardon, pardon the phrase, uh, corrupted by the world around them as much. And, and I think that that's like, get them while they're young is kind of like a weird phrase to say, but, um, the argument that we can't teach kids C++ or that it's hard to teach kids C++ and that it's an expert's language, um, is true because of the tooling, which is something I discussed in my talk. Um, because right now, if, like if I wanted to teach a friend how to program, I would teach them Python because they install Python, they start writing Python, and then if they need to use anyone else's library, they just use pip. And that's it. Mm-hmm. And with C++, it's like a 17 and a half stage step, and you have to like sacrifice a goat and hope that it's like, you know, the <laughs> uh, four days from the summer equinox, and if it's not, you have to, you know, find a patch for GCC so it compiles a new Mac OS. Like, it's, it's completely <laughs> random. Um, and things can go wrong. And if you don't know how a computer works and how C works and how auto tools works and all these other build tools, then you're going to be extremely miserable. Right. That was something Bjarna brought up in his talk, wasn't it? How he wanted to try to make C++ easier for new users, right? Yeah. And, and I absolutely agree with that. Um, I actually wasn't there for the talk because, um, I, I was, uh, with, um, uh, I'm going to, I'm absolutely going to destroy her name. I'm, I'm so sorry, Nicole. Uh, but, uh, Nicole Murkaz. Mercaza. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce her last name either. I, I mean, she, I mean, I was hanging out with her a lot throughout the conference, and and she told me several times, but um, I'm an idiot, so sorry, Nicole. Uh, so, um, but I, I was showing her my early slides because I had some some jokes that I wanted to run by her because I had a 
talk about build systems, which is extremely boring. And I wanted to keep it light so that people would laugh. Um, so I, I actually ended up missing that talk, but, um, caught it on, on YouTube later while I was at the conference. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Like if you want to make C++ easier for people, um, then don't put the modules TSN as it currently is maybe. Okay. <laughs> just, uh, just a little bit of an argument. I'm winking uh, for the people at home uh, all really, right. since you can't see me. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you, what do you think might be the best path forward? I mean, are you hoping that it just kind of gets scrapped and rewritten or, you know, maybe it gets voted into the TS and they can still make changes from that point on. I, it's not set in stone. Right. Right. Until C plus plus 20 is voted. Right. Right. But I, I feel that like there's a push to try to get it in as soon as possible. And if they get it in, mm -hmm. Now we've got, you know, two, three years to, to do it. And we've already had two to three years to get to where we are right now. I think it was announced in 2015, CPPCon 2015, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit yeah, before that, that. So, right. somewhere around there. But, you know, we're already dealing with a, people were expecting for C++ 17 and they said, no, put it in a TS because we want to see more implementations. Uh, we're starting to see those implementations and I don't feel comfortable with them. Whereas coroutines and ranges, I think are going to be fine. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a little less, um, uh, damaging to the system, but, um, the, my, my best hope honestly would be like, just make it work like Python or Haskell or OCaml even like, I don't care. Just something. It doesn't have to be the best module system, but just tie it to a file system. So people don't have to give a crap. Like there are so many other languages that do this. It's worked out for them great for years. And it's 2017 guys. Let's just, let's just admit that, that a file in the abstract machine is okay. Like, you know, it doesn't have to exist in an embedded system, but like, I don't know of anyone that's actually trying to compile for an embedded system, um, uh, on, on an embedded, on system. an embedded system. And, you know, I've, I've heard of some people saying like, oh, with, uh, you know, the nice thing about CMake and bootstrapping is that I can compile it directly on my like four megabyte, you know, AT mega chip and I'm a uh, AT mega chip and have my compiler run directly on it. And I'm just like, why would you do that? That's <laughs> such a terrible idea. Um, maybe, maybe if C++ had the concept of the abstract machine, which you target and the concept of a separate machine, which was the host machine, I'd be okay with that. But, um, in the end, it, it kind of goes back to the joke uh, that I had in the profile that you said for me, which was rage against the abstract machine. I'm just mad about the abstract machine, not having a concept of files, but then also having a concept <laughs> of files for, you know, the file system header. Right. So, um, and I don't think having, having a build system, uh, like if a build system knew, okay, this is the dir general directory layout that we're going to have then I think that it would be a lot easier to implement build systems. We wouldn't have to have, you know, processes run in the background constantly turning on people's hard drives that are, you know, running at 5,400 RPM in the year 2017, because they still exist. Um, I see them in, in the Bay area, especially since I have a, a very large swath of friends that have a very wide, um, range of income. And, um, it's, this isn't, this, these aren't, Arguments that I have against modules TS at this point, it's mostly just a lot of like, this does not solve the problem for everyone. This is creating more problems for, um, people that are on the edges of the C++ community or are not yet in C++ community. Um, and they may hear, oh, this C++ has modules now, like Python, this language that I've been learning, or like Ruby, this language I've been learning, or Node.js, like, you know, JavaScript I've been learning. And then they come to it and they go, oh, this is not, this is even more confusing. Like I heard C++ was hard, but I didn't know it was going to be this hard and that's mm -hmm. going to scare them away. And then they can go over to rust where modules will work more or less the way that they expected them to. And they do have problems with their module system, which they've admitted and they're working on fixing them. Um, but at least they have a module system that, you know, is directory based or file based in some way. And right. I like, and part of that is connect to their build system, but, um, it's also part of the, the compiler where the compiler knows generally where to look for dependent information. And, um, I, I don't know. I've got, as I said before, I have very strong opinions about these things and, uh, they're probably not the right opinion, but 
<laughs> but it's what I believe and it's what I hope would come to pass. But um, I, I don't, I definitely don't want the way the modules are implemented right now at this moment. Okay. So uh, I'm kind of curious at the beginning of the interview, you said that you uh, basically slept for two days straight after you gave your talk, which I'm sure was a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, me exaggerating? This is news to me. I've never right never heard of it. But I am curious. You said it was your first talk, and for uh, the people listening who have not talked at conferences yet, would you say it was worth the effort and the strain and everything? Absolutely. It, it was. It was okay. okay. It was mostly just like I had a lot of adrenaline leading up, uh, leading up to the talk, and I hadn't actually slept much that morning. And uh, right. immediately afterwards, uh, uh, Matthew Repair, uh, I absolutely murdered hit the pronunciation of his name, but he said, don't worry about it because I don't, I don't speak French. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, but he, he and I went and spoke for a little bit, and I was like, as the conversation continued, my eyes were just getting slowly closer to closing, and and I was getting a little little um, uh, raspier with my voice. But um, it, it, it was kind of like, it's kinda like, it felt like kind of like graduating. Almost, if that makes sense. Like, there's a lot of like mm. excitement in the air, and then you're just like done with it. And you're like, yeah, okay, I could really take a nap right now. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Relax for the first time in a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, I I drove up from the Bay Area to uh, to Bellevue, so that was also like exhausting. So I didn't actually have a lot of time to work on my slides leading up to uh, to the talk. Although I had been working on them for the for the previous like month and a half since I'd been confirmed for a talk. Um, and most most of my time at the end was just like trying out jokes that ended up not landing, um, and others did, others <laughs> did, you know. But I was like trying to yeah. to field them to people, and they were like, "That's not a funny joke at all. Why would you? Why would you joke about that?" Um, but then the joke would kill in in the talk, and then the ones that everyone was like, "Oh, that's a really funny joke. I hope that really goes off well for you." Ended up completely bombing in the talk. <laughs> Um, this is why I don't try to give jokes anymore in my talks. Well, just... <laughs> I, I need to give a joke because it's a build system. Like if you're, if you're there to listen to build system talk for an hour, like you're, you're there. Cause you're like, I drank too much last night and I'm here to, uh, like make it look like I'm attending a talk, but I'm not, not awake. <laughs> so, uh, so I haven't, I haven't been able to watch your talk yet on YouTube. What, what exactly did you talk about? Uh, so, so the name of the talk was there will be build systems that configure your milkshake. And, um, I had tweeted out prior to the talk, Hey, I'm giving a talk today in this room. Uh, come see it. It's about why all build systems are garbage. And, um, I also want to briefly state that, um, I exaggerate a lot, as you can tell from <laughs> this entire podcast thus far. And, uh, uh and also just, if you read my Twitter ever, you would know that I exaggerate a lot. But um, uh, the two two things I think happened because of that. One, the developer of the Mason build system uh, did a quote retweet and said challenge accepted, um, <laughs> which I was like, well, that's what I get for opening my mouth and putting my foot into it. And um, the other was uh, uh, I ended up putting a, a fake quote in the intro of my talk where I said, all build systems are bad. And you can quote me on that. And then it said, all systems are bad. Izzy Muerte, 2017, CPPCon. Um, and I think some people took that seriously. And I hope that they don't, because um, as a trash goblin, I enjoy garbage. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so um, like, it's it's kind of like, um, I, I do not like the guy, but Linus Torvald said years ago, um, you know, subversion is supposed to be a better CVS. And... Um, and like you're starting from a bad, th- a bad thing that you can't polish. Um, I'm paraphrasing here because I can't remember the exact quote. But he said like you need to start from something brand new. Sometimes when something is, right. is this bad, and going from the auto tool C make approach to build systems and having a DSL and having macros and having a thing that cannot be debugged in this year that we live in, <laughs> the the 21st century. Um, I think is an absolute mistake and continuing to go down that path is asking for trouble. Um, mm. And having a build system that you can't debug is also a problem. And so, you know, you have a uh, GN from Google, you have CMake, Bazel, Buck, um, Premake, WAF, uh, Scons, and um, uh, which two. one? Uh, Build 2 is written in C++ and also it's its own like makefile style implementation, so you can technically debug it. Um, okay. 
Um, but it's DSL that it has to declare things. I am against personally. Okay. I think I think I think these things should be automatically configurable. Um, you know, Python has a general concept of like this is where you place your directories, and then you can override that in a settings file. Um, but all of these still work off of directives. Um, and I'm, I'm a fan of data over directives. You know, you should be listing this stuff out. Um, if you've ever written a CMake file, I'm sure you've written a, you know, set name of project underscore sources, and then you just list a bunch of files out, and then you say add target, you know, or add executable, name of executable, those files, or add library, whatever. And right. it's like, why does that need to be function calls? Why can't that just be like a JSON list or a TOML list or YAML even? I mean, actually, no. Let me let me take that back. Never use YAML. Um, just don't. <laughs> YAML's great. YAML's great if you're okay with weird intricacies with its parsing, like not forgetting or forgetting to put a space between a colon uh, for the key and its value, or putting a space between the key and the colon, and then having an error and be like, I don't understand why this is broken. Why why doesn't this work? It's supposed to be a JSON subset, and it's not. And right, that's a that's a whole other can of worms, but. Um, I, I kind of agree with, agree with the Rust community when uh, they say Tomal is the least terrible, and I say yes, it absolutely is. Um, and like, I, I don't see why I couldn't just say, okay, this is my library. It's going to be called this, and here are the source files, and here are the include files, uh, and you can find those because they're in guaranteed directory lookups, and um, go from there. And you know, not having a directive-based build system means that you can then move to another build system because if that build system uses data over directives, then that data must be serializable in some format, which means that something else can write a parser for it. And then right. we don't end up with these walled gardens where, like, right now, if you use CMake, moving to Mison is you run a script that Mison's developer wrote, and it kind of, like, parses it, and it kind of creates a Mison file, but you still have to do a bunch of work to make sure it actually works the same way under Mison. And, um... You know, auto tools, forget about it. Like moving from auto tools to something else is like, okay, I have to read a bunch of M4 macros and try to hope that I can recreate this one for one. And if I screw up, like we probably won't find out for a while. And right. uh, you're just, right. it's, you know, like um, there was someone on the something awful forums a while back that had actually started a project where um, it was a Python script that could parse auto tools projects. And they were able to get, I think, like 85% of all the GNU projects. Uh, to work with it, and it would just read the auto tools thing, and then spit out a readable, workable CMake lists file for it. And wow. um, that those last fifteen percent were like GCC and Bash, like you know the oldest tools that they've got, that sort of a thing. Um, oh, and Ed, Ed did not work either for some reason, but you know what are you gonna do? Um, I don't know if I've ever actually used Ed. It's it's the best editor apparently. <laughs> mm, okay. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's not, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, the, the build system I think could be solved. Actually, uh, Nicole and I did start to, um, discuss a prototype because, uh, she was working on something kind of like Rust's cargo for C++ and I had started to work on one like this last year, um, after CppCon 2016, which informed a lot of the, a lot of my talk. I had a... Um, I think it was uh, the amount of notes I had was somewhere in the range of like 200,000 like words or something like that. And that's, that's what informed the talk that I gave. Um, a lot of it was bullshit. Oh, sorry. A lot of it, a lot of it was, <laughs> a lot of it was uh, not, not good. Uh, and ended up not making it into the talk because I was, I was thinking about it later. I was like, no, that that's, that's not true. Um, or that's incorrect, but um, the data data over directives thing um, is definitely a a a really big thing. And then there's also the other thing of um, in my talk, I uh, uh, I have a I had a comment um, that I can actually I have it I have it here. I could read it to you if you would like. Um, sure. Uh, so let me just pull it up real quick here. So the um, uh, when I when I gave like a mini encore talk uh, to Bryce Lobach and a couple other people, um, oh, that's right. This is what I got for. Okay, so when I gave this talk uh, again a second time in the lobby, 
Um, I had some people ask me, so did you source this from actual comments that have been made on the C++ subreddit? Um, because it sounds a lot like something that you might see, because I've, I've seen people say, hey, I wrote a new build system, and then they post it to the C++ subreddit, and it's like, you have flown too close to the sun, and Chris, you've already made a mistake. Like, <laughs> like you are you are in deep, and you don't even know. Um, but the like the, the first part of this is is pretty much like things that I saw, especially with the Mason build system. Um, and it says things like, it doesn't support my current project layout. I won't use it unless it does. Why is it written in this language? Why isn't it written in this other language that I prefer? Seems like a waste of an opportunity to get more people to work on it, i.e. the person who's making this comment. Um, there doesn't seem to be more than one developer working on it either. Uh, this tool is bad and you should feel bad. Um, you can't beat CMake. You should just give up now. 9-11 was an inside job, that sort of a thing. Um, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, that, and that is in my talk. I, I do say 9/11 was an inside job as part of the comment, so um, definitely got got some some sweet jokes out of that out of that talk. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, there's there's a lot of things that our build systems could do for us, and they don't um, because in the 1990s or the uh, 2000s, it was like oh, this is a more important problem to deal with. Um, people were more worried about stuff like Ccache or DCC. Um, there's also things like uh, scones using, uh, refusing to use timestamps by default because, well, what if someone runs touch on your entire build directory? And um, to, to which, by the way, the response should be, if someone is doing that, you have bigger problems than the fact that your timestamps are out of date. Um, right. <laughs> you know, like your your build system might have been um, compromised at that point and you need to you need to do a security audit i think at that point um uh and also things like containers didn't exist really you know it was mostly like yeah ch root jails and um uh, a variety of other things but like nothing was really concrete a lot of people didn't want to put the work in to understand windows um microsoft didn't want to put in the work for people to understand <laughs> windows i would argue um <laughs> uh uh, I mean, like a, a lot has changed, and uh, uh, like as as proof, for instance, I've you know I'm 28 right now. I've used Vim for 14 years of my life. Literally half of my life has been as a Vim user, and I'm starting to switch over to VS Code uh, for my daily driver because it's just much better than Vim, which is a what a terrible wow. terrible thing to say. But at the same time, um, the people that have been giving me gar- uh, you know like guff about it as have been Emacs users, and I'm like, really. You're you're gonna tell me about a slow bloated editor, really? All right. So uh, venting in particular, and yes, Ben, I know that Emacs isn't an editor; it's an operating system. Yes, it's yes. But if I but if I wanted to run, you know, a virtual box instance, so I could run Emacs, uh, I would. But I can just run VS Code instead. So. <laughs> So it sounds like it's in early stages, but um, where could people find information about this build system? Nowhere. That you're working Absolutely on? nowhere. nowhere. Nope. Okay. Nope. I, I do not want people to see this until it is at least 50% C++ because we are writing it in Python to start off with. Because there's no, <laughs> eco- there, well, there's no ecosystem for C++, right? And it's like part of my talk was you should be able to run a command and get all your dependencies that you can get. Um, and, and that's what you get in the other languages and that's what you can do in Rust and... Um, actually, I, like I, I had a brief, like three day, depressive period where I was just like unable to write code because I had spent three hours learning Rust, and those first two hours were just like running through their tutorials, and that last hour was implementing a, a Twitch chat client for the Twitch TV website, and I had implemented that in an hour, because inside of an hour I had downloaded um, a you know equivalent request library, an HTTP library, an OAuth library. And um, I was able to focus on the actual problem rather than having to wrangle dependencies. The most I had to do was go to their website, search for, you know, HTTP requests, and then get that library and download it. Um, and then, like, doing JSON serialization was adding a attribute to a type. And um, it's very depressing how far ahead the Rust tooling is. Uh, it's also hilarious to me because sometimes I will see in, this, in the Rust uh, subreddit comments like, yeah, we're kind of behind the C++ tooling ecosystem. And I'm just like, what ecosystem are you looking at? Are you from another timeline? Are you from another like planet? Like where, what tools are you talking about? Because it is a desecrated battlefield 
filled with just like the limbs of build system developers <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and dependent acyclical graphs that have been like broken in some way. And it's just, I, I, I was, I was physically depressed and just like stood up, walked away from my computer and did not do work for three days because I just could not at all. I was like, I just did more work in three hours than I could do in C++ in two weeks. And that is messed up to me because C++ isn't hard to use. I don't have a college degree. Um, I'm not good at computer science. I know what a dependent acyclical graph is because I taught myself how to program by writing a build system and that's it. And, um, like, cause you need to know what a, a DAG is. Um, so you can, again, I'm going to make the, the pun again. I'm sorry, but so you can DAG on the haters. Um, <laughs> um, and it's, it's, uh, it's just depressing that we don't have something like that, even just for the basic case for C++. Like, yes, a, a large enough company that was like, sorry, this this build system that you wrote isn't good enough for us, great. Best thing about C++ is that you don't have to use it. But I think that stuff like um, the Beast, Boost Beast, uh, mm-hmm. uh, web server, mm-hmm. majority of the Boost uh, tools, um, stuff like what Vittorio Romeo writes, what uh, Louis Dion writes, um, what I write, that stuff could very easily be like, oh yeah, it's up on you know this this uh, package manager thing, and um, you know Conan is not a good package manager for that. And I'm I feel bad saying this out loud because uh, you know like I've been in contact with Diego since it was B Code. Uh, he's he's one of the founders of of uh, Conan, mm-hmm. and um, the the issue that I have with it kind of goes into part of my talk, which was like, if I'm writing the language, I shouldn't have to learn any other language when I'm writing that. And if I want to write C++ and I want to do cross platform C++, um, I have to learn CMake, right? Like I can't just write C++ and not have my build system, like, and not understand what that is and how that works and whatnot. I have to know the build systems language, be that a make file syntax or, um, you know, a, uh, Python script or CMake, and CMake is going to be probably the one that people go with. And I have to learn this this language that is like Tickle but worse. <laughs> um, even though it now comes with Tickle as a dependency because of uh, ctest and c dash, and um, it's it's just it's disappointing. And then with Conan, my issue is that it, it's written in Python, and so now you have to know C plus plus, you have to know CMake. And you have to know Python, and um, and you have to know how their particular instance of Python and their Python API interacts with CMake, and that is, uh, like I feel like at some point someone's gonna be like, um, well, actually we've already seen it. There's some people that are like, here's a Python script that can generate a CMake file for you, and so now we have meta meta build systems. And at some point someone's gonna be like, well, the Python for this is actually kind of tedious. So here's another thing that I wrote in C++ to generate Python that generates CMake so we can compile our C++. <laughs> and at that point, someone's going to probably want to raise their hand and be like, wait, can we just like slow down for a moment? Cause we're going way out of control here. And someone's going to say, no, we can't do that because you need to focus on what's important, which is running code. But you know, our build systems get in the way of doing that. And, um, like for instance, as part of my talk, uh, are, are, that, are either of you familiar with the Juicero? startup in San Francisco by chance. Mm, no, I've heard. Okay. Of it. So the Juicera startup for the people that don't know is a company that created a juicer that squeezes packets oh. of juice. Yeah. Okay. Yes. It squeezes packets of juice, uh, and they raised $400 million in funding. And then they went bankrupt because, uh, people were like, wait, it's easier if I just buy the packets of juice and then I just squeeze it myself with my hands because, um, why would you need a machine to do that for you? And then on top of that, uh, the uh, Juicero company started to call people that would hack these juice bags jackers for a portmanteau of juice hacker. Um, and apparently their CEO uh, went to Burning Man, like depressed, and he was like, I'm here for inspiration. And then as he left, he, he got an interview with TechCrunch. He's like, I've got my next idea. It's going to be like Juicero, but better. Are you ready for it? Raw water. 
Um, and this is a real thing. That's that's a real thing, by the way. <laughs> but four hundred million dollars in funding, like imagine if that had gone to making a good build system. Like <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't if if four hundred million dollars went towards making a good build system, I would not be raising hell about modules. Because it would be it would be a solved problem because we have four hundred million dollars to make a build system that could just deal with the problem. You know? Right. But that's money that's going towards uh a juicer that squeezes packets. <laughs> So. Well, I think it'd be great to have you on again if uh, in a couple months you have something to share with the build system. Uh, but where can listeners go and find you online? Is uh, so they can find me on Twitter at Slurps Mad Rips, and that's all together with no underscores. Um, and uh, my GitHub is Slurps Mad Rips with uh, two hyphens in between uh, Slurps and Mad and Mad and Rips. Okay. And there's also a story okay. behind that that handle as well. So if anyone ever wants to wants me to explain, I'm more than willing to. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, it's been great having you on today. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. I'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let me know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, I'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. I'd also appreciate if you like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at LeftKiss on Twitter. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com. Website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com.